All right, guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. My name is Nick Coffey. I'm here with a Matt Hand. We are both of United Structural, and we're here to talk today to talk to you about detailing for steel construction, third edition, which at this point in the life is, is, is basically 10 years out of date. And it, it, as far as I know, there's, there, there's no process in place to update it, to, to bring it up. There's a, a lot of potential problems with that. There's also a lot that the book, as it exists, kind of leaves off. So we want to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, see what your guys' thoughts are, and uh, I'm interested to hear Matt's thoughts as well. So, right off the bat, Matt, or the the bat, Matt, what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, just kind of taking a quick glance through, it's the first thing I notice is there's nothing in there about modeling software, nothing in there about BIM. So, I mean, it it, it entirely predates that whole revolution that the industry has undergone, and it's it's something that sorely needs to be addressed i think and i it, i mean it, it's it's time for an update this thing was last run in 2009 it's 2020 now and we haven't even heard whispers of a new edition coming out so it kind of feels like we're just sort of being left out in the cold here yeah and like i at some level i understand there's going to be a little bit of a challenge as far as being able to negotiate the different softwares while still pr producing a book that talks to everybody, right? Um, the, the common knowledge or the, the generally accepted thing is there's there's two big boys, which are Tecla and SDS2, and then there's an also ran, which is kind of Autodesk's different entries into it, Pro Steel, Advanced Steel, Autodesk Structural. They've got a couple different packages. I don't know if they've put those together into one, uh, but they all fall in the c category of also rands, right? Right. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, it's it's the sort of thing where y you don't have to get into the, obviously, the finer points of how the individual software works. But as far as generating the deliverables, you know, how to be able to run reports, generating different things and files that you're going to need throughout the job, they, they all are able to produce these things. They can all dump out MRP data. They can all dump out reports, ABMs, bolt lists, things like that. And, you know, it, it, it's something that needs to be addressed one way or another. And you also need to be able to understand that whatever your software is, there's best practices for how to do things. And people should be aware that they need to be seeking what those best practices are. You know, it, for example, with SDS, if you're putting in holes and you don't know what you're doing, you can just put individual holes in, and then when you detail that member, it's going to look terrible. But if you understand how to put that in as part of a pattern, or, you know, even if you put the individual holes in but under the same command so that they do form a pattern, you're going to get much better results. So knowing how to look for those best practices, contacting the support reps and, and finding that out, that, that all needs to be a discussion because detailers need to know that's something that they need to be doing. Well, and it, it seems to just, just, you know, if you page through the book, it was written for a different age, right? It's almost right. an update of the second edition where they're like, okay, this stuff doesn't apply anymore. But it still has that very much approach of you're, you're one guy detailing a project, you're going to draw a beam, and you're going to draw a column. And you're gonna. It, it it doesn't reflect the reality that we're we're not drawing any pictures, right? We're creating a model and then we're cleaning up the pictures to to reflect reality. And it's an entirely different process. It needs to be looked at entirely differently. Right, right. It's 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 very much got the feel to it that you know okay we we've accepted that people aren't drawing on drafting tables anymore and so now they're using computers and, and it talks about computers like it's the new thing and back then it was the new thing but not even 2009 is not that long ago right but i'm just saying as an update from you know the second edition sure so it, now you've got modeling software that you've got to contend with you've got all all of these other practices that have come into play a lot of detailers don't necessarily take a job from award to fabrication all by themselves there's a lot of i mean if you look at job listings out there there's a lot of people that they're looking for modelers they're looking for scrubbers they're looking for 
individual components because they're starting to break down the individual uh, work of a detailer into assembly line like specialization where if you are really really skilled at modeling and you can plow through getting a model in and accurate and and all of that i i'll have somebody else scrub it who's at a different pay grade who has a different skill set you're just going to model the job and it, it it fails to address that entirely because when you were using even you know autocad or, or you know 10 years ago before or even older than 10 years ago before you know modeling became what it is if you were drawing it in autocad or something similar you were making the drawings it, it, that software was really just a digital pencil right the, the, nothing was really different about it it was just you didn't have a pencil in your hand you had a mouse instead right it accelerated the process but it did not fundamentally change correct how detailing was done and that's that's different now right and it, it comes with a whole new set of challenges. Like we, we ran into this because, and this is a, a common thing, less common now, but in the transition it was where you had what we refer to as an old school detailer, somebody who was doing piece by piece detailing, checking the work of a model detailer. And you've, if you didn't understand that process, and you didn't understand the software, you would get ridiculous corrections and it, it, it fostered a bad relationship. One of the things we ran into constantly was, why'd you do this thing wrong a hundred times? <laughs> I, I, I didn't right. do it wrong a hundred times. I did it wrong in the setup and it applied it a hundred times. Right. And I you recognized made one mistake. <laughs> right, right. And that's, I mean, that's an important thing that this book needs to address is the your, your modeler is the the senior guy at this point it has to be right there's too much power in that model to make mistakes you need to either have a, a close watch on them have close control over that process or not have junior people in the model at all right right because it, i mean it takes a bad setting to torpedo a job but when you're talking about who's actually scrubbing the drawings, you're so much lower on the food chain in terms of how much damage you can do. And even when you look at the drawings, there's, there's still a, a sliding scale there. Whoever's making the plans and the sections should be a little bit more skilled or a lot more skilled than whoever is scrubbing the individual member details. You know, it, it, there's, there's that sliding continuous scale of progression of your most senior people need to be making the model because they can ruin everything. Then the guy who's making the plans and the sections, they can ruin a lot, but they can't ruin everything, let's say. But then the person who's drawing the individual details piece by piece, but they have to, la they have to make many, many more mistakes. You make one mistake in the, in the, member details you've screwed up one member right and you no, almost it, have to be malicious to do that right, right. The, for most part the worst case when a scrubber makes a mistake is that information isn't conveyed in a way that is digestible to the the fabricator and that's one of the things in the you know in the the steel construct or the detailing for steel construction that I think that should be the main focus of the book, right? Like, here are details, and here's the why to all of these dimensions. Here's a thousand different scenarios and a thousand different ways of, of hitting it. So after repetition and repetition and repetition, you get the idea of, okay, I'm going to use a common work line. I, you know, there's different work lines for different type of members, but the rule is you use the work line and then you bevel off of it, and then everything is based off that line. Like, those common rules are so important to it, and, and that applies in modeling just as much as in detailing, because you gotta teach your, you know, the people who are putting the holes in, okay, here's your reference point, here's the, the slope, here's that information, and why it's important to your checker, to, to, to everybody else. Um, and it's, I feel like it's part that, that's really missing. Now, 
I, I do want to take a little bit of time and defend the NISD, okay? Because first of all, it's, it's a volunteer organization. And the people who raised their hands were probably resistant to doing so, right? They looked around, there are 20 people and somebody's gotta do this. So they're like, well, of these 20, yeah, I'm, I'm probably the best. And so it, it's really kind of hard to fault them, especially, let's say they, they produce an exhaustive book. We saw, they, they have a manual on their website because before we produced a video, we wanted to make sure that we were giving them due credit for what they, they have done. And they have a manual. And I said, okay, let's buy that manual. And then what did you say? So you can't actually order that specific thing online. What you've got to do is print out a mailing form, write down all of your information, and send away for it. You know, right, like a and, Sears catalog. Yeah, basically. Now, on that form, there are a couple publications that you can get, one being an AISC manual. You know, uh, and Let me just bring that up real quick just to look and make sure I've got the right order form. So they've got several publications. NISD Industry Standard Manual is the one that you're talking about. They've got Beam Cards, which is a CD. I'm not sure quite what that is. That's, Hot Dip that's Galvanizing. That's the properties of different Oh, is that shapes. the... Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so Hot Dip Galvanizing, what we need to know, painting and fireproofing from a detailer's perspective. Okay. Now, each of these... You're going to have to fill out this form and mail it in. However, they've got two on here. Detailing Guide for Erector Safety and Efficiency. They list a website. You can go there and presumably buy it directly from them online. They've also got the AISC NISD Detailing for Steel Construction Manual. That one you can buy at the AISC bookstore online. So the fact that I can't just pick these out, I'm going to have to send away and wait was a little bit of a hindrance for us with this you know it's, and, and now we've it's, got it's a, actually a, a deal breaker it sounds ridiculous but who in this day age a day and age is going to print out a letter and an order form and mail it out and then expect it to come back right like that's well, and mail it out and you've written i mean it, people don't have faith in the in the postal service the way they used to you've got to write out your credit card information expiration all that stuff on here yeah. And, and setting up an, an online store is a simple process at this point in time, right? Like, legitimately, if they spent five to 500 to $1,000, they could have a functioning online store that took care right. of it. Or piggyback and put it into the AISC's online bookstore that already exists. Yeah. Hey, yeah. sell our awesome. publication, too. Right. And I, I don't know what's in that, right? So I'm not going to send away, like I'm not going to go through all of that effort and then get a half-assed publication that doesn't cover any of the things that I hoped it would. Right. I have no there idea. Are, no, there, are no, there are no sample drawings. There is, there's no reviews. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like so this you don't is know what other people are saying that about it. There, the there's, a, there's a brief summary of what, what's there, but that's it. And here's the thing. The, the point that they made in our discussions with them, right, which were, I, I want to say, a little bit combative, right, basically, well, what the hell do you want us to do, right? This is, we're, we're stuck with this, which is a mentality that I do understand, right, is detailers won't part with their money, right? We can't get them to sign up for things. And it's a double-edged sword because... Detailers are saying, you're not providing anything of quality, so we're not buying. And the NISD is saying, you're not buying, so we can't produce something of quality. We don't have the resources to do it. And this is where I think that the AISC needs to step in, provide a grant, provide whatever else, and say, okay, detailing is critical to the success of the steel industry. So we're going to step in and help you out. Produce a good manual, and we will help you along that way. Right, right. Give, give them the ability to produce 
that quality document and then at that point you should be able to start standing on your own but you, you do need that bump to get started I mean at this point you almost have to think about it like any business you have to have capital in order to get started and then once you hit the ground running and start generating your money because you prove yourself then you can stand on your own but until then you're hampered well at this point it seems that the NISD has run out of steam and they're either going to need to get some sort of a reboot using that method or something else is going to have to form in its place because I, I'm not honestly seeing a great future here, especially, you know, you consider American detailers that feel like this is supposed to be their advocacy group group and you're seeing things promoting offshore detailing. Well, how much of a hit is that going to give their membership? You know, well, I, and their I don't argument, know where their membership stands either. Right. Their argument has been this, okay? We can't stem the tide. There are no... Uh, people aren't taking up detailing as a, as a position, right? They're not interested. We can't get them interested. And, you know... So many detailers are, are conservative, right, politically. This is such a classic case of capitalism doing its work. If we improve the pay of detailers, somebody will fill that role, right? I, we've started in this industry, right? We have customers, we have employees, and we're slowly growing. If there was a larger quantity of work that we were guaranteed and that our rates could be a little bit higher, we could make a little bit more, we could expand faster, we could train more people, right? This is the cart leading the horse. They're saying, well, nobody wants to be a detailer. Well, of course nobody wants to be a detailer if there's no money in it. But if we say, listen, just like you have to buy American steel, you have to buy American detailing then the, the amount of projects that are available goes up, which means our pay goes up, which means we can afford to train and hire more people. And this old trope of, well, detailers aren't training each other anymore is bull. There are new detailers coming up all the time. I meet them at all these conferences, right? They're being trained in a new way, a different style, but there are detailers coming into this industry. And they're also... Every, every detailing company is secret because that's, that's always the worst fear is that if I hire somebody who's new and I train them, I'm terrified that they're going to take that knowledge and either go work for a competitor, in which case I'm out all of that money I spent training them, or they'll become a competitor, which is just as bad. Yeah, I... And that's, know, and, and, and that's their fear. And I, th I feel like that's why, one, when they do train somebody, they keep them hidden as best they can. Try to track down a detailer that's working for another company. It's pretty hard. Go to a conference. You're not going to see many detailers that aren't the boss. You know, so they keep them stashed away as much as they can. And I think that's I think that's doing us a disservice by trying to almost make them like a trade secret that right. they're hidden. Well, and our answer to that again, right, is pay them more. If right. if the detailers are leaving your business, there's a reason for it. Right? You're either not paying them enough or you're treating them poorly. They they, they don't leave just on a whim. Right. If there's greater opportunity out for them, there for them, great. That's good for the industry. And so, again, the solution to that problem is greater pay. But you only get greater pay if we can start charging reasonable rates. And we do. That's it. Like, we're, we charge reasonable rates. We're profitable. There's money to be made in this industry, and we need to stop pretending that there isn't, right? And 
I, 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 I feel like another problem with that is how we're able to compete where others are not. So our, our biggest point of competition is that we're entirely cloud-based. So we don't have the overhead of an office. And when you don't have to pay for all of the electricity and internet and rent and heat and all of that stuff, it, 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 that allows us to compete more with people who have that overhead but they've stolen their software they pay their people a, a tiny yeah. amount of money an hour comparatively you know so that's the only way we're able to level that out and at some point they're going to figure out the cloud system too and then dollar to dollar how do you compete at all well, and that's the thing. You can't, right? It's, you know, it's like black and blue trying to compete on price with McDonald's. You, you just can't. It, that's, that, that's not a reasonable expectation. Right. So, I mean, I, I think the NISD's role in all of this, right, going back, should have been talking about the risks of offshoring, Right. And doing profiles on, you know, this guy at Steel Tech Fabricators in Oklahoma did this project. And look at all this money it cost him. Look at how much, you know, how many safety connections weren't made because the detailer didn't know about them. Look at, you know, I, 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 I jump up and down about the Hard Rock in New Orleans. And I don't, I don't know that that was an offshore detailer. I don't. But I do know that a responsible detailer should have flagged that building is unsafe. And I know that if in our organization, we would have, right? Like we would have almost instantaneously said, there's something wrong here. You need to take another look at this and, and really think this through. And if, if, in, if, if that's the message, right, if the AISC is consistently taking that message across, that there are considerable risks to offshoring your detailing or just not properly qualifying your detailers on the same, same token, right? Have a conversation. Right. Right. How many times are we able to get on a bidder list by just saying, hey, can I get on your bidder list? And then you get awarded a job because your price was low. There's no conversation at all sometimes with how do you guys handle anything? I mean, there, there, there's no conversation on safety. There's no conversation on checking. There's no conversation on ensuring quality or scheduling, uh, manpower, none of it. It's just, all right, you were low, start the job. Right. And when that's your focus, you're going to get what you pay for. It's right. not or a lot. Or you could, right? Like, I, and that's, it. our costs, as far as I can tell, we're not more expensive than other detailers. You know, we, we're probably more expensive than some of the cut rate offshore numbers. I suspect, but we're one of the reasons we can compete is because we're better at this, right? Like we've, we've made a good system, right? We we're constantly trimming the fat, looking for better ways to do things, not cracking the whip for our employees, but making sure that they're efficient, you know? Right. Right. We may charge a, a reasonable amount per hour, but we're an efficient group for that hour. You get a lot out of that hour with the way that we boost our efficiencies through, you know, parametrics, components, processes that just make us work more efficiently. All right. So back to the book. What if, if you're writing a book, what's chapter one? See, that's, that's always been kind of our issue is how do you write this book? Because there's so much that goes into detailing. I, to me, I've always tried to, to kind of take the process when we've tried to codify, you know, for training purposes, 
we tend to look at let's take a job from start to finish and discuss everything that occurs along the way so the first thing we want to do is deal with estimating you know what does it take to get the job setting up your contract reviewing specifications and plans and then from there you start you know discussing how to hold a kickoff meeting what are the things you want to be looking for and I think you just kind of go through the job step by step. You almost want to do like a case study of a really complicated, in-depth job so that you're catching as many of the things along the way that need to be discussed. See, I would, I, I would almost say that, that writing a book is a mistake. Right? You need different levels of book. And that's one of the things detailing for steel construction tries to do. It tries to teach everything from engineering to counting bolts to the same people. And it's not organized in a way that, all right, new junior detailer, here's what you need to know, right? Here's what you need to know to be able to model a basic job. Here's what you need to know to be able to scrub a hung lintel, right? It should be a collection of how-tos. I see. So basically following the training and development of a detailer as they learn scrubbing filler beams to scrubbing spandrel beams to braces and columns and things like that as, as they progress and, and learn more and more complex things. Right, right. Like, yeah, you need a chapter on connection design and understanding it, but that shouldn't be presented to a new detailer, right? That's it's true. not something they need to know. It's not something they're ready to understand. It's like trying to teach calculus to somebody who hasn't read, studied algebra. You just, you're, you're skipping too many steps and you have to not only get algebra, but you really need a strong understanding of it before you can move on. And, you know, I think you need, a, you know, a book for somebody who's managing a detailing office. You need one for somebody who's doing what we call scrubbing. We need one on producing plans. We need one on reading plans, you know, reading and inter interpreting contact documents. So a whole series of books then. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with that. That, that allows you to take it from the perspective of the new person rather than having a senior person just, vomiting information and trying to collect it in some meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, go through it in order that you need to know it as opposed to in order that you would perform it on the job. And I think that actually that goes back to the idea of um, the assembly line setup. So you're strengthening that business model in terms of how you're organizing your company. Yeah. So you graduate book to book and become a more and more skilled and useful detailer. Well, and, you know, it goes to producing a document like that that's comprehensive. This is how you do this thing. We'll take and, and improve the detailing industry because the amount of money that's lost in the steel industry by us customizing our drawings to every different set of and I use the word loosely, standards out there would, would absolutely stagger you, right? There is so much time spent. Change. I mean, try, talk to Steve who makes templates for, <laughs> yeah. for SDS2, just how many varied standards there are. If instead we had a standard, and if you want to modify this, you need to be specific because otherwise it's becoming, it's this. And then when, you know, Joe Detailer says, I've been doing this, I've been doing this for 20 years and this is how you draw this. If you can go to the book, the book, and say, nope, here it is right here, chapter seven, braces and gussets, work line, dimension off the work line, bam, there it is. Then it improves in detailing across the board. Right. And it also ensures a consistent product, not just 
the drawings being the product, but also the detailer themselves. So that you should be able to move company to company, software to software, and you just have to learn the nuances of how that specific setup functions, but you're looking to produce the same product, you know how to get there. Right. It's just a matter of the little finer points of, you know, how that's going to be accomplished specifically, but right. you know what that detail is supposed to look like and everybody agrees that's what it's supposed to look like. It's going to be instantly recognizable if you've accomplished that or not. Yep. And then it, it, it improves both the upstream and the downstream. It's going to make review time faster for engineers if things are presented consistently. Right? They can say, we expect detailing to NISD standards, and that's actually a thing. And then when, you know, offshore company X or crappy domestic company Y produces detail, details that aren't up to those standards, the reviewer can spit them back and say, you know what? These aren't acceptable. Follow the standards so that we're all on the same page. Exactly. It helps the industry across the board to be standardized. And then, too, we can train our fitters to recognize detail drawings. Here, this is how this is going to be presented to you. This is what all these dimensions mean. Here's how you lay it out. And it doesn't matter if the detailer is from Wyoming or Wisconsin. That detail is going to look the same. They can fabricate it the same. It, it's just going to make the process so much better. Right. Because if you consider that right now, you know, you talk to the fitter in any given shop, they have a way that they want their drawings to look. There is no standard, so they've created their own. And now you come in as a new subcontract detailer, and if you can't instantly, perfectly, on the first job, match those standards... You're going to get phone call after phone call after phone call because I don't understand how to read a stub dimension like this. I don't understand how you would do this. I don't understand. And it's not that they're stupid or that you've drawn it wrong. It's that you've presented the information in a way that you are accustomed to and they are not able to understand it because it's not the way they're accustomed to bringing that in. Right. And we're not saying, right, at least I'm not saying that there's not room for shop preferences in this, right? There, there's a bunch, like, you know, where do you want your stub dimensions from? Where do you, it's, it varies a little bit based on the equipment that you have. Right. Understandable, right? You present that information, there's a couple different options, but it's not yeah. every option. It's not just do whatever you want and, and tell us what it looks like. It's here's the standards. And if anything, the fact that there's there's now two dominant softwares has provided some level of standardization, right? They're used to seeing SDS drawings. They're used to seeing a Tecla drawing and the, the way that the information is presented. So they're they're comfortable with that. But we need to take that a step further. Right. Because even though there is that and, and that does help. We still get that when we talk to potential new clients. Do you use Tecla or do you use SDS? Because we like one over the other. We Something about the output of one makes us happy compared to the output of the other. Yeah. And, and it's, it, there it's needs usually to based be on they had a bad experience with one of the softwares. Yes. I had a checker, you know, I went to work for a company down in Pennsylvania and... I interviewed, okay, you know how to use SDS2, I use SDS2, I get down there and they're like, well, draw everything in AutoCAD. We don't like the way SDS2 looks. I quit. No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to draw everything in AutoCAD. It's, that's not what I signed up for. So, and then there's, like, the book, the, the, the third edition, Detailing for Steel Construction, jumps right into connection design and the intricacies of weld symbols and the way that the, the fang surfaces are and, and all that. And sure, that's important, right? Somebody at the detailing organization needs to have that information, but not everybody at every level. You, right. 
you train as you go. Just like you don't expect the first day erector to, to be in charge of making the site specific erection plan. Right. And it, it actually takes me back. And I mean, this is, this is way back, but, uh, I used to work at a Wendy's, you know, and the way that they trained people is they started to, they, they had little training pamphlets for every little position around the, around the store. Okay. So you're going to learn how the fry station works. You're going to learn how the sandwich stations work to make those. You're going to learn how to bag orders. You're going to learn how to take orders. You're going to learn how to do the drinks, to deal with money. It, it, every, every step of the way had a little training procedure to it. And I think you're right. I think that by splitting the book out into multiple volumes and going steps and step by step along the way, eventually, as you have progressed through all of that, once you've learned everything, you're eligible to become a manager. And then, you know, as you learn the management things, learning how to do inventory, placing orders, things like that, you work your way up the food chain. So it's all very well laid out in an assembly line fashion and i think honestly the, the fast food industry kind of had that all figured out from the jump and i think that's where we need to go is learning that assembly line breakdown where everyone can be specialized but you keep adding to your repertoire the next thing along the way as you develop yourself right right and you know we, we in, in our company we're a fair demonstration of right like we've got one guy he's a computer expert he's good at programming Okay, if we have questions about that, that's, that's what he's doing. We've got a guy who is very knowledgeable about welding, all the processes, all that stuff. We have somebody who's in charge of document control. That's their specialty. They're good at that. They have those skills. You know, I, I have the, the thing for connection design. That's my thing, right? You're all about efficiency and modeling. How can I do this the best way? You know, we, none of us has all of those skills. And I think to expect anybody to have all of those skills is silly. You can get, as you get senior, yeah, you add more to your repertoire, but you can't be an expert on everything. You just can't. And one of my favorite features of Modern Steel Magazine, when it still mailed to my house, was the steel quiz and the case studies, right? If we had that equivalent, if that's what the NISD was producing, right? Here's a quiz, sharpen your detailing knowledge a little bit, right? What's the wire grade for welding stainless steel? You know, what's the minimum clearance that you need to weld a stud on, a, on the top of a beam? Is it acceptable to weld a stud to a secondary member? Can you weld the stud on top of the pore stop? Little questions like that. You give them 10 minutes, and at the end of taking that quiz, they feel good because they knew how to answer some and they learned something for the ones that they didn't. It was a great model. And I think that's, you know, one of the, the ways that we can move forward. But in the end, detailers, uh, detailing organizations, the larger companies, they've got to step up and, and offer the payment for this. And also the AISC has to, has to support this, right? They are getting gobs of money from the fabricators, from the engineers, from even detailers. We pay for the AISC membership. That money has to come downstream. Right? But it's not going to happen if nobody asks. Right. So. All right, what else are your thoughts? That's it? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's about all I got. I mean, I... I I could sit here and read off the email that I got and just be all angry rant, but I don't want to do that. Right. I mean, I do, but it, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good look. It doesn't serve a purpose. Well, other than it gets everyone else going, yeah, me too. You know, they took our jobs, but it's. <laughs> well, and it's funny too, because all those people will stand up and say, yeah, I'm angry about this, but ask him for just 50 bucks. Right. All right, let's throw in 50 bucks. We'll do a Kickstarter, and we'll write book one, you know, how to, how to scrub drawings. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, though, is detailers don't like to spend money on things that are established. So the thought that they would spend it on spec is just unthinkable. So to get detailers together and say, hey, 
you need to you need to sign up for the NISC. They need some more money so they can write this next book. You know, uh, uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. But, right, and I, you know, we uh, we haven't signed up for the NISD. No, nope. because there's no evidence to support. Right. In that, fact, at this point, there's evidence to support that they're not 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 only doing nothing, but they're working against our against our better interests. Yeah. Because I mean. It, in the response that I received, it, it even says, and I'm going to read this part out loud. So if we are to be viable as an organization serving the steel industry, we have to be international. That is a very terrifying statement. Right. If you can hold international companies to the same standards as domestic companies, I could see a path forward, but that's not the reality. They're right. not subject to our laws. They're not subject to our rules. And there's no combination of things that are going to make them become that. Right. Right. If you could force them to pay their employees as our employees are paid, if you could take an average detailer's wage and say, this is what the Americans make on average. You have to pay yours at least that much. If you had to prove on a regular basis that you were not pirating software because we've got anti-piracy laws here and the software companies will absolutely go after you for violating them. Pretty tough to do on somebody that's, you know, it doesn't have to play by our rules. If you could do that, first thing that happens is their price goes up, okay? So as soon as their price comes up and it matches American detailer prices across the board, now you're talking about a comparison of value. What am I getting for the money? Am I getting good quality drawings or am I getting garbage? And now we're on a level playing field and now it comes down to your actual skill and ability to produce the drawings. So if they can produce good drawings, then they can compete. If they can't, they can go away because they're going to have to play on the same playing field as the rest of us. Yeah, and it, wouldn't, it would not take long, right, it, or, or much, right? With a couple of thousand dollars, we could take considerable steps forward as right. far as getting a, a, a website produced that works about beginning to produce an industry magazine that that discusses these issues. It doesn't need to mail early, right? All of those things, it, we just need steps forward. So I guess here's my ask to the community out there. This is a small channel because it's for detailers, right? Invite the other detailers you know to watch, to comment, have a discussion with other detailers that you know about the need for us to act together on things to start to move our industry forward we can't do it alone we just we we can't and i don't mean us we detailers can't do it alone and we're all off uh, doing our work. We're so focused on it. In, me- in the meantime, the future is running right out the door. And if we don't uh, fix it now, and it can still be stemmed. That, they're, that, that is a lie that we can't fix it now. All we need is the, the tiniest bit of, of, of amending the legislation, right, that basically says if, you're buying, if you have to buy American steel, you have to buy American detailing. And then outside of that, we also need, you, you know, talk to the AISC, talk to, and say, listen, I need you to support efforts to produce detailing, and it can't just be within with through the NISD because they don't, they don't seem to be able to adapt to the modern age of detailing. They 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 seem to be trapped. Right. It 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 feels like. They've decided that their best business model going forward is to just cave. And as American detailers walk away, overseas detailers are signing up 
And so it's pretty clear where that's going to head in the end. Yep. That's that, that's how it has to happen. And I the the one thing that I do want to discuss is to the the overseas detailers who who watch our channel. This is not a ta- an attack on a detailer. Okay? Each one of you is entitled to a job, a well-paying job, one that provides you the the that you're entitled to provide for your family just like we're entitled to prov- provide for ours. It's about the systems that are set up. We have to, by law, follow all sorts of employment rules, laws. We have economies that demand that we pay X for a detailer because there are so few of them. This is not about knocking you down just because you happen to live in a different country. This is about us trying to keep the playing field level so that we can continue to feed our families. It's a whole different level of thing. I, I, we've talked to a bunch of them, and we love every one of them, right? The people that we have a real beef with are the ones who are not playing on a level playing field because we can't compete with that, and that means we can't feed our family. And that's it. That's my my final thought. So that's it for this episode of the Steel Forum. We like to hear from all of you down below. If if you're interested, if you'd like to see you know an industry magazine start to come out that maybe starts to inch its way towards providing those guidelines, providing those standards, so that you can go to your boss, you can go to your checker, and says I followed the standards. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to be a part of it, if you want to show what the standard for a hung lintel is or for a brace and how it should be detailed, let us know, and we'll make sure that you're a part of the team going forward. We, we hope to be a big part of this effort, and we hope you will be too. We'll see you back here soon on the Steel Forum.